to what we're going to talk about today in just a little bit. If you want to come on down to the Headwaters Science Center, feel free to stop by seven days a week. Six days a week, we are open 9.30 to 5. And on Sundays, we're open 1 to 5. So, today, continuing the series of live streams about different types of dinosaurs, we're going to talk about hadrosaurs, otherwise known as the duck-billed dinosaurs. They're pretty well known and pretty recognizable, and there's not a whole lot of crazy, mind-blowing stuff in this one, but they are a pretty crucial dinosaur to understand. They were quite plentiful in their time and made up a lot of the wildlife you would see in the Cretaceous. So first thing is, they were around approximately from 75 to 65 million years ago, so not the widest stretch of time, but they were spread out quite far, ranging all the way from basically Antarctica to the Americas, Asia, Australia, Africa, Europe, pretty much another very widely distributed dinosaur. Uh, the other thing is they were quite varied, the largest being around 50 feet and 20 tons, and the smallest being only around 5 feet and 30 pounds. Uh, the other thing about these dinosaurs, they had hundreds of teeth. Um, despite being known as the duck-billed dinosaurs, they both had the front of their mouth, which is kind of like a beak, but in the rear of their mouth, they had what were called dental batteries, which were made up of hundreds and hundreds of teeth. And those allowed them to chew their food quite efficiently. These dinosaurs are also thought to have had true cheeks, meaning they could chew with their mouth closed. And that helped them process their food a lot more before it got to their stomach, which is probably a good reason why they were quite successful. Being able to process food efficiently can help an animal eat more make sure that they get as much nutrients as possible. The other thing, they were also browsing herbivores. Like we went over with ankylosaurs. There weren't really a lot of grazing opportunities in the Cretaceous due to the fact that there wasn't a lot of grass. And let's see. They were also related to another type of herbivorous dinosaur called the Iguanodontids. You've probably all heard of Iguanodon. It was one of the first dinosaurs discovered and named. And we will go over Iguanodontids at a later time. So another kind of cool thing about hadrosaurs is they were often crested. Uh, in the drawings behind me, I've drawn a Corythosaurus and a Parasaurolophus, which were two very prominent crested hadrosaurs. Now, not all hadrosaurs had crests. Some actually had either no crests at all or uh, sort of nasal structures, like Mudaburosaurus, which lived in Antarctica, or opposite end of the world, Ugru Nalik, which lived up by the North Pole at the time. And let me give you a sense. Ironically, two very similar looking dinosaurs. So the other thing about hadrosaurs is they are Hornischian dinosaurs, meaning they are from the family of dinosaurs called bird hit. So they also were a type of dinosaur that they were what we called faculative bipeds, meaning they could walk quadrupedally or bipedally, depending on what suited the situation better. They likely did not walk bipedally as much as they grew older and larger, but when they were younger, they often probably walked bipedally most of the time. Another thing, these dinosaurs exhibited amazing nesting behavior. Some of the first fossils of dinosaur eggs were actually of hadrosaurs, a species called Myosaura, which literally means the good mother lizard. They also show good evidence of herding and social behaviors through foot track pathways and skeletal finds where many skeletons of many individuals were found at once. And they also, from the, uh, what's called a scleral ring, which is a bone in the eye, uh, modern animals that have it would be birds, very closely related to dinosaurs. It shows that these animals may have been what we call pathemeral, which means they were active in brief periods throughout the day and night where the animal will feed, they will uh, do social behavior, seek out mates, seek out other sort of stimuli, water, and they wind up being roughly evenly active day and night in spurts. Which is very odd, though, for such a large animal. Ephemeral animals today tend to be a lot smaller, uh, so we're not quite sure why these animals may have been ephemeral. So, I went over chewing for a second with these dinosaurs. 
So chewing is a very specialized jaw motion of side to side grinding of food. And not even all mammals can do it. And very few animals in Earth's history have been capable of it. But what it allows is it allows an animal to really process and grind up their food so their stomach doesn't have to do that much work. So another thing about hadrosaurs is they are one of the dinosaurs that we do know definitively were not probably feathered. We actually have a great skin impression. It's called a dinosaur mummy of an Edmontosaurus in the Dakotas, which was found with most of its skin fossilized. So they are dinosaurs also that we vaguely know the color of as well. They are also generally in the brown to yellows to tan shades, at least for Edmontosaurus. Um, and likely due to their size and uh, certain other factors in their environment, they probably didn't need to be feathered. One thing that they may have had an advantage of is being in large social groups. They could share warmth easier, potentially. Um, the other thing about these dinosaurs is, while being browsing dinosaurs, Ugrunalik was probably also omnivorous. Uh, they found a very well-preserved Ugrunalik with uh, stomach contents suspended, fossilized, where its uh, gut would have been, and they found crustacean and uh, other shell uh, critters, basically, in there, ground up. Meaning these dinosaurs are also one of very few definitively known, potentially omnivorous dinosaurs, animals that eat both plants and meat. So, we got a couple uh, key things. So we've gone over what is chewing. Now, why the crests and nasal structures? So, today, animals that have distinctive structures like that on their heads, uh, a good example is antelope. And this is why I have two antelope skulls on the table here. So this is an impala. Impala are a smaller gazelle, but they're not too small. And they have these very distinctive curling horns. And wildebeests are a decent bit larger, but there are other antelope that have similar sort of cow-like horns, like this animal. And an antelope, oftentimes, coloration and the horn shape were used to visually, and are used today to visually distinguish species. Another thing with these crests, so the crest of Parasaurolophus was hollow. And with replicas made based on fossils, we've been able to replicate some of the sounds these animals could have made. And with different crests and different shapes and the different nasal uh, growths, they produce different noises, so it could have been a way, much like birds today, where they had different calls, which shows that these were animals that often probably you would have multiple species of hadrosaur in an area, much like when we went over ceratopsians, where you'd have multiple species of ceratopsians in an area. They need a way to distinguish each other, and that is a really efficient way with sound and visual uh, indicators, especially for animals that had very good eyesight, like dinosaurs, from we could tell. Uh, nesting behavior is another thing to go over. For a long time, dinosaurs were thought to reproduce a lot more like lizards and turtles, where essentially you lay the eggs and it's up to them to get through the rest of their life after they get laid and buried. Um, but Myasaura showed that these dinosaurs constructed quite elaborate nests. They would actually uh, cover the eggs in leaves to keep them warm. And most likely the adults hung around these nests. Now, some dinosaurs did reproduce in a way where they did just lay the eggs and let them go. Sauropods are quite prominent one where there is very little evidence of adult interaction once the eggs are basically out of the mother. But hadrosaurs have a lot of great evidence. One of the good piece of evidence is actually how numerous their fossils are. They had a really good survival rate of getting to adulthood. Uh, the other thing is the young uh, hadrosaurs typically looked a lot like the adult hadrosaurs. They were much like a lot of birds and reptiles today. If you ever look at um, uh, megapode birds in Australia or uh, baby alligators, they're pretty much ready to go right out the gate. Uh, to some degree, meaning that the parents, while they are there giving them help, that's kind of just an added bonus on being already ready to go right when you're born, essentially. And then we're going to go over obligate versus faculative bipedalism. 
So we are what you would call obligate bipeds. We don't really have a lot of other options based on our anatomy to walk. We walk on two legs. It's not at all comfortable or efficient to walk on all fours as a human. For an animal uh, much like a, let's say a chimpanzee, they can be faculative bipeds. While it may not be nearly as efficient to walk on two legs, it can, it can be advantageous for a chimpanzee to occasionally walk on two legs because they can free their hands up to do other things. And in the case of hadrosaurs, it may have been an advantage for reaching up higher browsing options of food and trees while still having the good option of going for lower down vegetation. Uh, these dinosaurs tend to get used a lot in dinosaur documentaries just as kind of cannon fodder for carnivores to go through when they want to show carnivores hunting. And they often get used as filler for, we need a lot of a herded animal for dinosaurs. So let's put a couple couple thousand hadrosaurs out in, uh, in an open area so we, it looks packed. But overall, they're quite fascinating. Uh, and, at, and often with new species being found, hadrosaurs are pretty common. And in the modern day, dinosaurs aren't simply given Latin names. Uh, Ugrunalic is actually an uh, Inuit uh, name. Oftentimes now, dinosaurs are being named in native languages, which is something that I like. It gives these dinosaurs something uh, more like a common name rather than simply a scientific name. And it's something you don't often think about, that we refer to dinosaurs pretty much exclusively by their scientific names. You, uh, Around today with modern animals, you typically call them a common name. That's why we call dogs dogs, not Canis lupus familiaris. Uh, with dinosaurs, though, you call T-Rex Tyrannosaurus rex, um, which is its scientific name. And hadrosaurs, oftentimes, since there's a lot of them, there's a lot of weird names, there's a lot of weird looking ones, and they are, they were a staple of the environment. Um, oftentimes there will be animals like wildebeest today where they make up a lot of a population of just biomass. So the other thing with these crests, by the way, I just remembered to talk about, is they probably were a bit of a display structure as well, much like a turkey's tail fan or a peacock's tail fan. Uh, there is some evidence of sexual dimorphism in some hadrosaurs where the males probably had these a little bit bigger crests. Uh, Carithosaurus is one where there's a little bit of evidence that the males may have had a little bit more prominent of a head crest, where the females may have had subtler crests. Parasaur lophus, that big kind of like banana shaped crest which actually is partially a nasal structure as well is noticeably and measurably a little bit bigger in the females or not the females in the males it is still present in the females which shows it was probably there also for the acoustics so for species identification but the males having those slightly bigger crests is probably a more attractive trait to the females uh james anything i didn't cover you, you think should be talked about um on these critters? Um, did you go over the chewing stuff? Yeah, the chewing, and the fact that that was a really rare thing, that we don't really have any other dinosaurs that we know of that could chew, which makes these actually quite special. Mm -hmm. um, How did other, animals, other, other dinosaurs uh, masticate? So they actually probably didn't. They probably swallowed it and used either gizzards, gastroliths, oh, or like just like snakes did. today, your stomach just does all the it's chemical the work. Yeah. And we will go over how other dinosaurs process their food when we hit other groups of dinosaurs. When we get to sauropods, we will cover gastroliths. Uh, and when we talk about, I think, tyrannosaurs, we'll talk about gizzards a little bit, because they may have had them. That's okay. <laughs> um, because it's a very bird-like trait, and they were one of the more bird-like types of dinosaurs. Uh, the other thing is, again, very widespread all over the world, all the way from north to south, east to west. There's not a lot of animals like that. I know we've been going over a few groups of dinosaurs recently that are pretty widespread, but one of the reasons I like talking about that is because often... Groups of dinosaurs weren't. They're like the field mice of dinos. Kind of. It's, Everywhere. They, they really were. It's kind of a very unique animal. It shows that it was a unique and efficient niche they had found for an animal. One it that like was... like a very kind of just generally kind of middling like design. It's it, just like we care for, the, the young get cared for. It's a very good generalist strategy. Yeah. If you care for your young, they have a good chance of survival. And with how these animals ate very efficiently and having a broader diet, 
They could just kind of move anywhere. They could be anywhere, and they basically would survive pretty well, and that's something that not a lot of living things can ever really claim. Do you think that these things would have had migration patterns? It's very uh, strongly suspected because when you think of how large these animals could get, you know, 20 tons and 50 feet long, that takes a lot of food, even with a slightly lower metabolism than, say, a mammal of that size. Um, there's no way you're sticking in, like, a home territory. And herbivores do tend to be more migratory than carnivores. Carnivores can kind of settle down in territories because... If one carnivores need, don't need to eat nearly as much mass of food. Even a large carnivore is not eating the equivalent. You need so much more energy dense than plants. It's and it's easier to process because you're conver up. you're essentially when you're eating food you're converting whatever you've eaten both into energy and into you essentially yeah. into material amino acids plus a bunch of already produced fat raw um, materials for building cells. Yeah. and it's easier to take meat of some other animal and just convert that into cells for you than it is to basically have to process very rough vegetation and get all you need from that to make what you need in your cells. So, so synthesizing amino acids from any plant, plant matter is pretty tough to do. Yeah, so herbivores have it a little bit tougher than carnivores. Yeah. Oh, the other thing, forgot to mention. Uh, yeah, duck-billed dinosaurs, they were named because they do have very prominent beaks. Um, and I did want to show the ducks that could have helped with feeding for initially plucking food off of branches or shrubbery. Um, some ducks today are semi herbivorous, which is pretty good. It shows that the beak could be used like that. So it's a good bit of evidence for these animals potentially using it. They were initially actually thought to be semi aquatic uh, for a long time, in around like the 30s and 40s, I believe, maybe around then. A lot of dinosaurs, the larger ones, were thought to be semi-aquatic because people were not sure how such large animals could support their weight because we were looking at these animals with the assumptions of mammal biology, not looking at them as very bird-like animals. Uh, dinosaurs tended to have a lot of air sacs throughout their body, and we will get into those when we talk about sauropods. Because... How, how, did, the, how did those crests work? What, what kind of structure is that? Is that just, like, bone? It right is up? bone. Yeah, so it's bone. Um, very it much. Skin? We aren't sure about all of them. Some of the thinner ones, like Myosaur, may have had a thin layer of skin over it. Uh, obviously, I think Parasaurolophus had probably a thin layer of skin over it. But they may have been quite bony, from That's, what we can yeah. tell. They may have had keratin. We're still not quite sure on some of them. When I see something like Parasaurolophus, part of me wants to think that there's... Like some sort of like connective skin between the neck and that crest. Like it feels wrong that it's just sort of sticking out like that. And they used to be reconstructed that way. There's probably a reason you tend to like to fill that space in like a fin because yeah. these are the the hadrosaurs that everyone always loved to draw, standing about you know waist yeah. to rib cage deep in water. Well, with maybe that. that has to do with the modern consensus not being as much for them being aquatic at all? Not really. They were probably very terrestrial. Dino they could swim. We do have some actual swimway tracks, but it probably wasn't a graceful like, thing. Moose, moose can swim. You know, yeah, well, swimmers, but probably not even that graceful. Moose are actually quite graceful swimmers. Yeah. These guys, it was probably more akin to a bison going, well, I got across the river, I guess. Yeah. Uh, the, tr the thing that we have evidence of with uh, Edmontosaurus, the mummy, is they didn't have that good of a tail for swimming as Spinosaurus had we went over last time. They had a more conventional dinosaur rounded tail, not a fin-like tail. Mm -hmm. And that means these dinosaurs wouldn't have had as effective thrust in the water, and their legs were really not the right shape. Their feet were a little bit too small for surface area for getting good swimming action. So they, they kind of feel like the deer of the... They're a lot like, like um, ungulates today, a lot yeah. like sort of... Uh, I always liken them to sort of like cows or other cud chewing yeah, or, ruminants yeah. because sense. of their unique way of processing their food. Well, it's not the same way. We know it, how they digest it. Uh, mostly, basically, by chewing it up in their mouths and swallowing it. One thing that probably has been uh, theorized or hypothesized is they may have had digestive enzymes in their saliva. That's not unheard that's of. That's kind of what I was wondering, yeah. So it's not unheard of in reptiles or reptile-like animals. Uh, even our own hognose snake here at the Science Center does have digestive enzymes in its saliva, but most reptiles, and pretty much we don't know of any birds that have them. So with dinosaurs, 
it might be there, but we have no way of telling, so it's purely speculative. But if any dinosaur was going to have digestive enzymes in its saliva, I would guess on the dinosaur that evolved to chew and process its food very efficiently. We don't have a lot of evidence. Like a pretty good chance of it. We don't have a lot of evidence of gastroliths in their case. What's a gastrolith? Uh, we we're going to get to that in a different type of dinosaur. So uh, stay Same tuned. Next week. Um, two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> um, but. That does lend credence to the fact they have some way of processing their food mechanically, which is the teeth, but then there's the chemical way, which probably was a bit in the mouth and a bit in the stomach. Again, very efficient eaters. These did dinosaurs they, can be best described as eating machines. Did they, uh, do you think that they uh, just had one stomach? So we don't really, that's when they're, I would probably say probably only one chamber of their stomach. We have no other animals other than ruminant mammals today so that we have like any evidence. New, new, uh, innovation. Given that it's soft tissue and we do have preserved stomach contents of these, we have, I think it's reasonable to say they did not have multiple chambered stomachs. It's a rel that is a relatively mammalian trait and not even a universal one. It's a very specialized one. Uh, these animals are, though, still pretty special for their time. They often get overlooked for more visually interesting dinosaurs. They didn't have a big tail club. They didn't have big claws. They didn't have massive heads with teeth. They didn't have horns. Well, they do have crests. But they were super successful. They were arguably more successful than some of those more fancy dinosaurs because of a consistent niche and an adaptable one. Being a generalist animal, being able to do a lot of different things, much like we talked about with the dromaeosaurs being very good generalists, it made them very widespread. These are kind of the herbivore equivalent to that. Being generalists and being very adaptable makes it really easy to find a way to survive. But yeah, so tune in, uh, I'm gonna say next Saturday for the next dinosaur live stream. Uh, we'll be going over another carnivore. You probably picked up the pattern, I alternate carnivore, herbivore. And we're getting to actually one of my favorite groups of carnivorous dinosaurs. I'm quite fond of the next ones coming up. So, 